button. Okay, and I'll. Uh... And then I'm going to mute everybody, and then unmute you. So mute okay. all. Okay, Kim, are you unmuted now? I believe I am. You are. Okay. Okay. And um, just, okay. Can you see it? We're good. All right. Um, here we are at the Zoom on Nature, Great Salt Pond, section six, and we're starting off. Uh, we're pretty much going to be doing the uh, interior part of the Cormorant Cove, starting right here at uh, Cormorant Point. Last week, we saw a lot of cormorants and other birds out on the point, and we're going to be just going around the cove and ending at the uh, Coast Guard Station and uh, Channel entry. And then I'll just have to figure out how to get across for next week. So here we are uh, in my old favorite map showing the whole of the uh, harbor. And the section we're doing is, um, is um, this area right here. And uh, from uh, the, the, here's Cormorant Point. And here is where the breakwater hits the tip of the land over by the channel entry. Um, and I will be sort of taking that, that trail around the inside and out to the channel. And here we have the aerial of uh, more current day. Um, and what I want to point out here is actually, this is a pretty nice aerial. It shows what, the first part of the Cormorant Cove that we're starting over here. It's just a, a lot of docks. There are six private docks in uh, Cormorant Cove. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then it uh, opens out to a more sandy uh, mud flats kind of area. And then it goes rocky again until it gets over here. And there are four buildings right here that I'm pointing to. You can't see it that well, but they're red roofed. And those are all the buildings of the Coast Guard Station property. And they include the station house, uh, the boat house, which is uh, on the water, uh, the motor pool that's um, behind over here, and then what's called the chief's house. Just sort of help get your bearings when we get around to that point. So with that, here is where we were last week on the left, pointing out at Cormorant Point. And now we've just done an abrupt about face and now we're heading down to the sort of, I guess this would be the south. We're heading south along this first beach. And here's the first dock that we're gonna see. It's a very cobbly beach on the, the, the sides of Cormorant Cove are very, they're not big cobbles like the ocean, but they're stony. I, I guess I should say that it's a stony beach. But before we uh, start down the beach, uh, the point, Cormorant Point is right here where that rock is. And this is about the best I could do, but you'll see that there are three, uh, four green buoys. One, two, three, four. And they roughly make a square. It's just the perspective that makes it not look square. And those, those buoys are shellfish commission buoys. And they mark off an area in uh, right here that you cannot shellfish within that area because that area is a restoration area for shellfish. So for our local oyster, pe oyster people are putting down uh, oysters that they're not selling. Uh, and they just put them down there to start building a reef, uh, a restoration reef so that the oysters um, will just live there and they won't be um, harassed by people trying to dig them and take them home to eat. Um, and they will hopefully spend many years there setting their own spawn year after year and hopefully setting, eventually setting a pretty nice uh, wild stock, what they call a wild stock of oysters so that the day may come when um, you could go along the shores of the Great Salt Pond and find your favorite oystering place and uh, not rely on the, uh, on, the uh, shell, on the aquaculturists, which for me, uh, it's pretty nice to rely on the aquaculturists. Uh, we can get baka shuck um, from Chris Warfel and Chris Littlefield sells at the farmer's market and, and um, 
Catherine Puckett sells at several of the restaurants as does Perry Phillips. So our four oyster people are selling in local markets. So it's a lot easier than going and getting the wild stock. But, but with the work of the Shellfish Commission, another great organization working for the benefit of the Great Salt Pond. Um, maybe we will someday. And I'm gonna pause just for a second. I don't know if you could hear that helicopter, but it's went right over my house. <laughs> but it wasn't coming here, so don't worry. Okay, here we are. We've come to the first uh, dock, private dock. And what's great about the private docks here and should be all the private docks around the Great Salt Pond is that you can go under them or over them easily. Uh, everything below mean high water belongs to the public in the state of Rhode Island. And so uh, just because somebody has a private dock, it, they cannot impede your travel along the shoreline. And um, fortunately for me, I don't usually have any trouble passing underneath uh, these docks, especially at low tide. So after we go under this first dock, we get to the other side and we can get a distant view of uh, the, the next dock coming up. But you'll notice the substrate, the sand is, you know, it's rusty. There's a lot of fresh water coming into this area. Um, it, it precipitates a lot of iron and rust from the upland waters. And, um, and it's very stony and it has to do with the currents and the current flow of water into the uh, um, Cormorant Cove. But as you go along, just a couple of things you might notice, uh, there's a rock, which actually has three types of seaweed on it. It has rockweed here on the rock, just sort of starting and some floating here. That's a, a brown algae. And then over here floating is some codium. That's a green algae and a big leaf. I'll say a leaf of uh, sea lettuce, which is a one or two cell thick film of, of uh, seaweed or algae. Uh, and it's a really beautiful, um, uh, seaweed that we see here. And some people do eat it. I haven't yet tried it myself. I prefer the sugar kelp that Catherine Puckett grows, but um, uh, it's sort of amazing just to see those three types on that one rock. And then if you come inland a little bit, the bank near um, the outflow for fresh water is very peaty. In other words, it's got a lot of peat in it. It's not very sandy. So it's kind of muddy, thick, dense, yeah, a hummocky, but it is supporting a really good population of uh, Spartina grasses on top of it. And these little holes are things that bury in there. A lot of times what's been there is a, a rib muscle that somebody's pulled up. And as you go along, there's uh, the next sort of feature to this side of the, uh, of the Cormorant Cove is this outflow. This is a freshwater outflow from a Cormorant uh, Point Swamp. And if you want to know more about that, that was a previous Zoom last winter. You can find it in the archives about uh, the fresh swamp be, uh, that on Cormorant, uh, on Cormorant Point that flows into the New Harbor or into Cormorant Cove uh, every day of the year, every hour of the year. And sometimes when the tide is up, uh, this pipe is nearly full or uh, covered. And when it's low, it's not, but water is flowing out, fresh water is flowing out. So that is one of the reasons that uh, oyster reef is placed where, or the restoration reef is placed where it is. Because as I mentioned last time, um, oysters like their, wa their uh, water a little bit fresher than total uh, salt that we have on most of the ocean water as it comes in. So an influx of fresh water kind of sweetens up the water a little bit for those oysters. And it just sort of looking around the edge, this, this flows out and then it flows out. This is a pretty low tide the day that I'm here. Um, high tide mark is right about here. So, um, you know, there are times when you're walking along this stretch of the beach, you might be able to get over the docks, but it's pretty hard to get past uh, the outflow of water unless you're wading and, uh, it's easy to wade at low tide, a little bit more challenging at high tide. So other things that we, uh, oops, we're gonna pass that. It's just a, a, a close up view of uh, water flowing out. And actually you can see a little whirlpool right there. Where the water is flowing pretty fast. 
Oops, there we go. I'm not going to run that because we haven't had very good uh, success with our video. Uh, so just going to skip by that. Uh, but as you go along this, uh, this shoreline, even though it's rocky, uh, it does have a lot of interesting things to find. And sometimes the best thing to find is the unexpected, what you didn't expect. And uh, just the texture and the colors that you can see just laying there waiting for you to, uh, to notice them. And on the one side, a, a lost feather, probably a molted feather, uh, based on the colors, probably a gull. And then uh, somebody's very nicely tied up their Danforth anchor and left it on the beach <laughs> below the low tide mark. The rope is all there, the chain is all there, but it's not attached to anything on either end. <laughs> but there it is waiting for good use. Now we've come along to another, let's see, this would be, the second dock. And I just pointed out this one part of the dock because it has this very tall pole. Uh, it's got, it had some recent work on it. And in fact, recently I saw the dredge boat, uh, the uh, pile pounding boat, putting in some new piles and doing some work on this dock. Um, and it's got this tall pile with the steps and a platform. And as much as I like to think it's an Osprey platform, my guess is this dock probably houses a sailboat and it might be a way to gain access to the height of the uh, mast. Now that is a total hypothesis. I don't really know what it's for, but that would be my guess. And if anybody's familiar with this dock and at the end want to clue me in or uh, inform me better, that would be most welcome. But I thought it was interesting and obviously new. So that's... Uh, a private dock. And here we're to the third private dock. Looking back around the corner, we've just come around this corner, we're looking back and here's that tall post on the dock that I was just talking about. And then if you look the other way, you're looking towards the next private dock. But you notice as the beach takes that corner, you can kind of see it here, it's kind of a sharp little corner. It's not a right angle by any means, but it's a, it's a good curve. It makes a definite change in direction. And then all of a sudden the beach turns sandy and wide and no longer stony, um, which makes means that the docks, uh, the water is more shallow and the docks have to go out even farther to get out far enough to um, have some good berth for, the, um, for their resident boats. And then we'll pass on to see what's along the shoreline. Now you start to see things. Uh, I didn't find too many critters along the shore um, when I was doing that first section, but I looked down right at the edge and there it was, a, a, a horseshoe crab mold, which we've seen, I think, on almost every walk that I've done around the Great Salt Pond so far. This is a fairly small one and you can see it's a little, the camera's angle is a little closer to the uh, horseshoe crab molt than it is to the quahog shell, uh, but it's not much bigger than a, than a good cherry stone or a good little neck. And, um, but obviously there's quite a few of these open, kind of clean open, kind of freshly open. So I imagine somebody had eaten those recently. Um, and it probably wasn't a gall because it's not smashed open. So just, things to find along the way. Uh, as you go a little bit further towards the next dock where there's um, a little bit uh, more pilings in the deep water. This is a very low tide I happen to be here on. So we have a lot of blue mussels in this area. And they usually blue mussels grow on stones, on rocks, pilings underneath a floating dock, um, which all exist in this harbor. Uh, but they also grow on rocks. And growing up, we always used to go to Cormorant Cove to get bl uh, blue mussels because there'd be a rock, maybe, you know, maybe 12, 18 inch rock just out there and the mussels would be all on that. But the problem with the Cormorant Cove is the shifting sands and uh, a storm or a wind one way or the other can bring in a lot of silt and sand and smother them. So for a while it was, we kind of lost the mussels in there. Now they've been coming back fairly well recently, but they do tend to get mudded in. Um, does it mean that they're, as long as they're still living and clinging to something hard, they're still tasty. They're not quite the right size yet. You have to, you have to 
check among a lot of them to get the right size muscles, but um, but they're coming. I hope I, actually these were taken before the storm. It'll be interesting actually to take a look and see if uh, how much sand has been moved in to this area, if any at all. Uh, given the wind direction, probably not. Uh, although yesterday at Andy's Way, I did notice some changes to the substrate and um, some moving around of sand in that area. So blue mussels, if you're a forager, good place to go get them. And now we're approaching uh, the very uh, last, the sixth dock. Uh, this is the big one. This is the around where, so you can see some mussels pointing out here. And this is more like my childhood where there'd be just sort of rocks here and there, and then the mussels would be all around them. Um, but again, easily, easy to go underneath this, this, um, this dock. But I decided to go on the dock and uh, look back a little bit at um, where I had come from. And you can now see uh, the fifth dock. Do I have that one, two, three, four? Yeah, the fifth dock is right here. We've already come by that one. We've come to this big one. Looking back at this sort of the whole, I guess this would be the Western shore. Uh, let's see, sort of, yeah, the Western shore of, or the Southern shore of uh, the Cormorant Cove. And if you look in the other direction, you're looking up again along the high beach um, and where the road is, which you can tell because there's a car and a, a nice little sign saying no shelf fishing or no, um, no soft shell clam. And if you look down towards the lower part of the beach, you have this, again, it was very low tide. So you, oops, you could really get the, um, the whole width of the beach was being exposed. Um, but this is a really interesting part. This is where if you go to Cormorant Cove, this is the part of the beach coming up that you're most likely to spend any time on, whether you're kayaking or swimming or drawing or shellfishing or looking for critters. Um, this wide, thick, mud flat like beach is really a great spot. And, and it's also great early in the summer for the um, spawning horseshoe crabs. A lot of them spawn and mate in this area as well. Um, it's sort of like, the uh, counterpart to Andy's way without all the people. So don't tell anybody. <laughs> and uh, that sign I referenced, it says no soft shell clamming. So this is one of the few areas that you can actually find soft shell clams on Block Island, but the season is not open for soft shell clamming. Um, there's just not enough of them to support uh, all the hungry mouths that would want them. So there is no soft, there, you cannot take a soft shell clam out of the Great Salt Pond, at least not legally, which is why this sign showed up in the middle of the summer, because there was quite a bit of uh, sort of, I think, unknowing. People just took them because they didn't know they can't take them. So we're trying to educate people about no soft shell clams. Now, what is a soft shell clam? We'll find out shortly. But again, here's another great view of that, uh, of those of the sand flats and mud flats and tons of stuff in here. And um, so we'll start to see some of them just laying on the ground. I, I saw these two, um, uh, this is just this little pile of shells. Uh, this is a soft shell clam. It's very oblong. It's a, it's a clam that can't quite fit its whole body in its shell. This is not a live one. I wished I had sought permission beforehand to, uh, to dig one up so I could show you a, a live one, but I didn't want anybody calling the shellfish police on me. So, uh, but it's an oblong uh, clam and it's the ones you steam and they have, sometimes they call them, um, do they call those little necks? I always get confused with the terms. Uh, they have the long neck that you peel it off. Some, some people very elegantly call them piss clams. Um, I'll leave your imagination to that. And then there is another clam that you don't see so often, but is doing well in this area, and it's the razor clam. They're not quite long enough yet uh, to be taken, but occasionally you find one. Uh, they're very interesting when you find them in the, um, in the, when you find one because they actually have two siphons. So the way you look for them on the, on the shoreline is to look for not one little dimple where the siphon of the soft shell clam would be, but two little dimples right next to each other 
where the um, double siphon of the ra razor clam would be. And they're very hard to get. They are down in the substrate, straight up and down vertical. And they have a big foot, very powerful foot, and they can just suck themselves down into that mud much quicker than you can get a hold of them. And they're strong enough that they keep pulling. If you happen to be on the west coast of the United States, they have something called a gooey duck, which is a big uh, form of a razor clam. And they're big and they're really powerful and you really gotta know what you're doing to try to, to, to uh, get one. I've been known to be shoulder deep in water, refusing to let go, but it still was a struggle to, to claim the clam. But of course, it wouldn't be a walk anywhere around the Great Salt Pond without me stopping to look at birds and pointing them out. If you were with me in person, uh, we would be spending quite a time, bit of time on these peeps. Now, peeps is just a, you know, a, a group name for a, a bunch of shorebirds that all tend to have various peeping sounds and calls that are very difficult to take a, uh, to tell apart in some cases. Uh, so. I often say if you were a land bird, if you were a bunch of sparrows that you couldn't tell them apart, you called them LBJs, little brown jobs. In the case of shorebirds, they are peeps. Unlike the ones you get at Easter, they are not pink and blue and yellow. So this one, I actually spent quite a bit of time on this bird. I, there, we have two very common sandpipers uh, in the harbor, semi-palmated and least sandpipers. I think that these are the semi-palmated uh, sandpipers, but they're hard to tell. Um, they seem to be a little bit more black versus brown. They seem to have very little uh, markings on the upper chest, which would make me think semi-palmated. Uh, but And their leg color is supposed to be diagnostic, but you can very rarely see the leg color. And in the light, um, the sort of olivey green blackish legs can look black. Um, so, but if I was betting, I'd have a little bit of money on the semi palmated sandpipers, but I'm ready to be corrected at any time. But aren't they beautiful? And then next to that, a little bit easier to identify is this plover. Um, and this is probably our most uh, uh, abundant. Uh, plover or shorebird on uh, the shores of the Great Salt Pond uh, this summer, in the summer, any summer. Lots and lots of these little uh, semi palmated plovers with that one black uh, necklace all the way around. A piping plover doesn't have the brown, it's much whiter, and it has not really a necklace so much as a collar. Um, but this is uh, lots of these guys around and um, there's very little difference between a, a pipe, a plover and a sandpiper. They're all about the same size. They're all uh, peeps. Sandpipers tend to have longer, thinner bills. Plovers tend to have shorter, stouter, more conical shaped bills. Sandpipers tend to be in general, a little more spelt, a little more stretched out. Whereas plovers tend to be a little more uh, compact and I wouldn't say plump, but compact, I, I guess is the word. But the great thing about the semi-palmated plover, besides its necklace, it has those beautiful sort of yellowish orange legs. So moving on, it's just a beautiful shoreline. Um, and if you're looking at the shoreline, you might miss the bird in the middle of that picture. And that bird is um, either a red, a, a um, ruddy turnstone, or it's a semi-palmated plover, of which there are two in this photo. Let's see if you can see them before I point them out. So here's the semi-palmated plover and here's one. And there's the ready turnstone. And uh, it's a very handsome bird with um, its red legs. And it's called a turnstone and it's actually in perfect uh, habitat right now. It's small stones and shells. And unlike a sandpiper or plover that are well, a sandpiper is more likely to be poking into the ground looking for things. The turnstones 
uses that stout little bill to flip over stones and shells looking for crustaceans and little shrimp and other things that are underneath and around the, the stones. And it was going along the beach here, just flipping them over one after the other, looking for its meal. So ruddy turnstone's a beautiful bird. But I was really captivated on this day with this short-billed dowager, of which there was just one very long bill. Um, and it's just beautiful. And I'll just kind of quickly go through some of the, the photos. Uh, this is his classic feeding uh, style, poking into the, it pokes, spends a lot of time poking into the ground, uh, looking for mostly worms, but also little shrimp and things like that. Um, here's one, two different forms of feeding. You can see maybe, if I bring this up close, it's just about to pull up a worm with that very, the bill is um, very pliable, so it can open up at the tip. And they're related to the woodcock, which you can sort of see, which also have long, very pliable bills. Um, and then this one over here has his bill halfway submerged into the uh, sand trying to um, find dinner. What I really love about these though is just the beautiful plumage, the scalloping on the back. Um, a big eye stripe, the long bill. And there is another dowager, the uh, long bill dowager. It has a much longer bill. It has a, a thinner bill and um, it's much wider on its under parts. And what gray there is, is more to be, I mean, what uh, brown there is, is more like a barring as opposed to a spotting. And you can see these are quite spotted and, um, and much wider than it would be if it was a long bill poetry. And of course, the best part about watching birds is watching birds. And sometimes they get an itch that they have to scratch. Or sometimes they're looking over their shoulder and saying, what the heck are you doing there? Um, but the, the feathering is just exquisite. So we've gone from the known to the unknown. What is this? Are the, these, I should say. Well, they're gelatinous egg sacs of some sort. Uh, they're probably, um, well, they're, what I know so far, and I haven't gotten a lot of information is, first of all, they're different forms. So they are probably the egg sacs of different animals, different species. Some of them like these are very round and relatively small. And some of them are much bigger and very globular. Um, they, um, they're some benthic uh, creature, whether it's a worm or perhaps some mollusk, I really don't know. And I'm, I'm waiting for some assistance with the Great Salt Pond scientists. And I hope to have the answer by next time, exactly what animals are these? the egg sacs for, but there are a lot of them on the mud flats. Um, and the, the theory would be that the benthic, in other words, living in this, in this, under the sand and mud is uh, putting out its egg sac, sac attached to the bottom, to the mud. These are all attached to the mud or, and, um, and they're floating in the water and when, it, when the tide comes in. So that when the eggs are ready to be uh, to hatch, to emerge, and to be dispersed, they're right there in the water column, so they can uh, find their place to settle and become another uh, benthic or or creature that lives on the substrate itself. Uh, but just to look at the forms again, as I said, small round ones, as I saw earlier, and several of these that are very globular. And this is pretty big. This is like the size of my hand. This one's fairly large too, but it had an odd look. So I thought I'd see what I could do with it. And I actually could stretch it out. It was actually a long tube uh, that was sort of curled in on itself. Most of them seem to be associated with a little hole in the sand right there. And you can see this one is a different one also right there, um, which gives me more idea that if I suppose if I dug down there far enough, I might find the critter or a critter that I could then then uh, guess about or start looking as to exactly what species is doing this. Um, and as I say, some are very uh, linear. This one is really stretched out. This is not the same one as this one over here. And it's just a long stream stretched out, but it's like a tube. Um, 
So, so some things are amazing and interesting, but to me, as of yet, unknown. So we'll go to things that are more known. We'll continue our way down the beach to the other sort of side of Cormorant Cove that is again becoming rocky and stony. Um, but, uh, and we're getting our first close up looks of the uh, Coast Guard Station house. And um, this is the motor pool. This is the one we don't see too much in most of the photos. This might be the only photo I have that includes the motor pool, which is a low building behind the station house, which currently um, is the, um, all of these buildings are now used by the town of New Shoreham for housing for various town employees. The motor pool uh, have been made several apartments, I guess you would call them barracks, and that's where the state police stay when they come uh, on the weekends uh, through the summer. So you probably know that state police have a presence on Black Island on the weekends uh, all summer long. And that's where they stay, um, courtesy or hosted by the town. Um, so we'll go along the beach a little bit more and look for some other things. Again, I've seemed to be focused on this one. I got another view of the substrate, looking at that sort of typical stony beach. And oh, there my eye saw something alive. Can you see it? It's right there. And whoops, wrong way. It's an oyster just sitting on the beach. Uh, not sitting, it was sort of half attached. There is a uh, right off the beach in this area is where several of the oyster, oyster uh, people keep their stock for the um, for the summer, they take their oyster. Every, nobody can uh, shellfish in the southern part of the, of the Great Salt Pond where most of the uh, uh, farms are, most of the agriculture farms are. So they take their market size stock out of the southern end of the Great Salt Pond and they have them in uh, marked off areas in this part of the, of the Cormorant Cove that has a lot of uh, transfer of fresh water and, and um, is considered safe for them to uh, to spend the summer and easy access to the aquaculturers to go get their their market size uh, for animals when they need to but every once in a while one of them uh, breaks loose and finds its own way out or one of the fishermen decide oh, it's too big and they just uh, they have a tendency if they're too big and they think they won't be very you know, people won't want them because they're too big. They tend to just throw them overboard in this area, which again is very stony. It's a good area for oysters uh, with the hopes that it will, um, you know, spawn a couple of generations, perhaps set some in this area as well. So in addition to the oyster, I also found lots of these moon snail shells on, the, uh, on this beach. And I found moon snail sh shells throughout the walk, but I've yet to find a live moon snail. And since I only have one section left, I thought I better get at least a picture of a halfway held together moon snail shell. But I'm still holding out hope that I might have a live moon snail for our next talk. But this is what they look like. Um, it's a fairly large um, and they can get even bigger than this. I would say that's about two and a half inches across. And now uh, you can kind of see why it's called a moon snail. It looks like a moon, round and roundish and white. Maybe it looks like a half a moon. Um, and then it comes in typical snail fashion, that beautiful um, spiral right there. And these are all related, whether it's a periwinkle, an oyster drill, a whelk, a moon snail, a slipper shell, they're all uh, in the snail family of um, of um, mollusks. Um, so hopefully we'll get one yet that's alive, but for now we'll be satisfied with that beautiful shell. And uh, we're getting closer now to the end. The, the end point of Cormorant Cove is kind of right here. We've just come in like a big, a big arc, not quite an entire circle, uh, but if you went this way or straight across, you would end up at Cormorant Point where we started. And uh, we're still going along this, this, this rocky edge and seeing a couple of gulls and getting some better views of that, uh, of the beautiful Coast Guard Station House, which I think is one of the most beautiful structures on the Great Salt Pond. 
but I found another horseshoe crab molt along this. And uh, unlike the other one, which was maybe two inches at the most, this one was about four inches across. Uh, this is good size uh, uh, horseshoe crab molt. So the, the, a horseshoe crab of, of that size is probably five years. And the good thing is it molted. It left this behind and uh, is going on to its next uh, next couple of years of life. We have a very healthy um, harbor for horseshoe crabs as witnessed by all the molts that you can find now, uh, evidence of growth of, the, of this species throughout the harbor. And uh, here we've come right around, uh, we've come around this point. This is about where I was standing when I took the picture of the oyster shell and the moon snail. And it comes to this little point, not much of one, but a little point. And there's the point that we started, Cormant Point. We've just come across around this and ending there. And now we're gonna start down the beach towards the, um, the Coast Guard Station House. And the area where the oyster uh, people keep their, their market wares are right off of this point. And they're all buoyed individually. So each one of them knows um, uh, whose is whose. And actually the whole area um, that contains storage site for all of the oyster people um, is a, a, a shellfish lease that is leased by the town of New Sherm, the Shellfish Commission itself. Uh, so each oysterman aquaculturist can really only have one lease. So they needed a separate place for um, the summer storage. So the town assisted uh, through the Shellfish Commission by getting their own lease so that they could then make that space available to uh, the aquaculturists to, to store, have their summer storage. So it's just another way in which the, the in this case, the town, the Shellfish Commission uh, is doing a lot of work underwater in, in Cormorant Cove to, uh, to make the great salt pond great. So we'll turn our attention to the beach. We're getting closer to the boathouse and the dock, even closer yet. Again, it's a beautiful beach. It's, it's, a, it's a little bit of sand in the upper parts, but mostly it's rocky. And then this wonderful, again, it was very low tide this day, a lot of seaweed. And then these rocks are, um, there's seaweed attached to all of those. It's like a slurry of seaweed weed uh, algae just kind of floating there. So it's uh, quite a rich environment in terms of habitat, whether it's habitats for barnacles or seaweed or crabs or moon snails or, or even oysters. So, and as we go along, we found the stack of these uh, slipper snails. We've seen a lot of shells piled up here and there on our walk around the Great Salt Pond, but we haven't found too many big stacks. We found this stack. It had been dislodged. So initially this shell would have been on a rock or on something really sturdy and, the, and there the stack would stay. Uh, so some wave action or something must have knocked this one off. So I kind of propped it up there. So it gave the, the, the right idea of what it's supposed to be doing. But although this one has been knocked off and therefore the animal is dead, these are all alive. And they just, this is how they do it. They stack up on top of each other. And there, there's only, let's see, there's five on this stack, five living ones, one, two, three, four, five. They can be much higher than that. These are all pretty good size. So, so as you usually look at a stack, as you go up, they get smaller. And what's really interesting about slipper snails is that the bottom one or couple are the females. And the upper ones are the males. So of course that, that means that the, the, uh, the sperm material can float down to where the females would be, be laying their eggs or having their eggs. And for all I know, they make one of those egg sacs. I'm gonna have to learn. But, uh, but if the stack gets bigger, in other words, other uh, slipper snails land on top and settle and attach themselves, um, if, if too many get taller than say, let's just say that this one is a male. If it gets three or four more on top of it, this one might turn into a female because the bottom ones always want to be female and the top ones are all male. So they are, I guess, hermaphroditic and can change their sex as a uh, situation uh, calls for. So if we look, stop looking at the ground and look up, we again, I see a magnificent view of that uh, station house overlooking 
the Great Salt Pond. And um, here it is from a slightly different view. The Coast Guard Station House was built in 1935. It's now owned by the town of New Sherm uh, in the early 1990s, I believe it was. The Coast Guard actually stopped having a presence, uh, a personnel uh, presence on Block Island and they gave up these lands and housing quarters and facility to the town of New Shoreham. Uh, and they now house summer staff as well as in the past, their building official has maintained an apartment in the station house. Um, he's in there now, but he has retired and will be leaving that uh, facility at the end of the year. Um, it's always a question what to do with this magnificent facility, because again, it's not just the station house, it's the boat house, the motor pool and the chief's house. Um, but it used to be a lot of uh, Coast Guard personnel were based on Block Island. And now the, the presence of Coast Guard for Block Island is maintained in Point Judah. So if there's an emergency, uh, we have to wait for them to get here from uh, Point Judith. Although there are several um, tow companies that maintain a summer presence out here so that they can be Johnny on the spot when the opportunity comes to, to, uh, to render service and make some money. So, but I cannot get over, you know, I'm just very taken with this building. Here is viewing from the dock, the Coast Guard uh, station dock, a good view looking back at the boathouse. Um, part of this is fenced off. There used to, it's a big wide uh, ramp and there used to be another dock off here to the right. Uh, now it's just the left. And um, so you can look back and there were actually people working here that day. And uh, this is a historic image. Um, Anybody um, just think for a moment, what might be historic about this image and this date? So I know you can't hear me and you're all muted, but I'll tell you, it has to do with the flying of the flags. Um, I might never see again, uh, the flying of the hurricane warning flags at the uh, Coast Guard st station, uh, the double red with the black square. Um, so it, of course, before we have a lot of, we got a lot of radios now and it's pretty easy for all mariners to be warned about what weather is coming. But there was a time when weather forecasts came to just a few sites like the Coast Guard Station or the Weather Bureau. And the easiest way to uh, transfer the information of what weather was coming um, for local mariners who might not have a radio was to fly uh, various flags uh, coded for different weather conditions from fair to rain to small craft. We often hear a lot about small craft warning or advisories. That's a single red triangle um, warning for a storm warning, a big storm is coming is a, is a single square with a red square with a black box. And then over here, of course, is our hurricane warning uh, flag. And they, this particular chart uh, indicates what winds would be needed to necessitate the flying of those. And in this case, it says 64 plus knots, and that translates into 74 plus miles per hour, uh, which I would say was pretty darn accurate because I think the highest gusts of wind uh, in our last tropical storm last weekend was 75 miles an hour. So uh, it well warranted the, uh, the hurricane warning flag system. But again, I was quite surprised uh, when I happened to be noticing, oh, I guess I better keep an eye on the weather while I'm walking around here in the Great Salt Pond. So now we've come up to the dock. We've looked back at the station house and the boat house and noticed the, uh, the weather directional flags, warning flags. And now we're looking from the dock out towards, out the channel into uh, Block Island Sound. And uh, this was, this was last Saturday, I think. Um, and it was a fair day before things got a little bit foggy and not so fair. Um, I might be wrong, it might've been the Friday. I think it was, I think it was Saturday. Anyway, um, the people were at the beach enjoying themselves. They were even waving at me <laughs> saying, come on down, the sand is great. 
And uh, I took a, a little bit, I just thought they were people waving. Well, it turns out they're all people that I know. And one of which is one of our local police officers having probably what is a rare day off this summer. So I'm happy to see him and past students and friends uh, waving uh, from the Coast Guard beach. It's become quite a popular beach for people um, because it's nice sand. Um, it's, it's better for beach activities like sunbathing and reading and fishing uh, and toddlers waiting a little bit, but it does drop off very quickly. So it's not really a terrific beach for swimming. And of course, you don't have to swim very far before you're right in the middle of a channel where there's a lot of boat activity. But for enjoying this, the beach and the, and the cool air and the scenery of boats going back and forth has become quite popular. And if you look in the other direction, uh, you're looking across the channel. There's a buoy marker there. The New Harbor Channel was dredged uh, and finished, I should say, it was finished being dredging to establish the, uh, the uh, channel as a federally maintained channel uh, in 1895. So that was about, let's see, 35, 40 years before the Coast Guard Station uh, was built. And just to get your bearings right across is where we'll be going next time. But that channel marker that you see there, red, I always learn red right returning. In other words, you keep the red buoy on the right side of your boat when you're coming into the home part. And if you go on the other side, it might be a little too shallow for you. So any boat will be wanting to stay coming into the harbor or going out will be wanting to be stay on that side of the, uh, of the buoy marker. And if we continue down along the channel's edge a little bit, you'll can see you're sort of starting to see the two breakwaters at the end, one on both the north side and another one on the south side. Uh, again, often this beach is really full with, with fishermen. They love to fish in here, especially at the change of the tide. It can be great for everything from bluefish to stripers to bonita to winter flounder, just depends on what's running and what's in season. And again, a, a little bit closer getting out towards uh, this breakwater. Um, now what's interesting about this breakwater, which is kind of hard to tell from this elevation, um, is that when this was originally built in, um, in 1895, the land came to about this part in the breakwater. Uh, more than half of the breakwater seaward on this side was in the ocean. Um, this is the only place on Block Island where the island is increasing in size, uh, and it's because the drift, the currents bring sand up along from the south to the north along the west side of Block Island. And once you put out a solid structure, a jetty, a seawall, a, a breakwater, it slows the flow of the water, uh, which is carrying the sand, so that the sand falls out and uh, gets deposited. And that usually happens in sort of a regular way along the whole West Beach. But with the breakwater there, it started uh, having it happen sooner. So that over the, let's see, 35, not quite, uh, 1895, yeah, over 100 years, 140, uh, 120 years, 25 years that it's been in place, um, it has built up land from about this point for almost to the tip. And, and um, all of that is sand that would have been deposited along the entire Western side of Block Island. So um, it's great for this area. It's made a, a very wide dune system, um, but it is the reason they have to dredge this harbor at least every other year, if not every year, because that sand, uh, keeps flowing up and then it comes, slows down and then it comes around the edge, the end of the breakwater and then it falls out. It tends to clog and build up in the channel. So the Army Corps has to keep that dredge on a regular basis to maintain the channel. The other th bad thing about this is that all that sand would have been building up on the West Beach north of here. Uh, and uh, so now if you go along the West Beach north of here, say from uh, what we call Bean Point down to, to uh, the North Light, uh, 
as you get close to the north light, you have more sand. As you get farther up towards the channel, you have less. And right in the middle there, you have where the um, transfer station comes out, what is generally called West Beach. And uh, that is losing sand and has lost a lot of sand. And it has not had the benefit of 120 some years of uh, regular deposition of sand along its shores. So it has been eroding and eroding and eroding. And now with sea level rise and more extreme weather, uh, it's more vulnerable than ever. And all the sand that would have been there is piled up behind uh, this breakwater. Not good or bad, it's just what happened. So again, to look across the other side, you can see a, a small boat has just come in. It is on the correct side of the, uh, the, the red can, the red nun, the red can, I guess, nun, I think they call those nuns, um, on the right side of the marker. And if you look back, turn around from whence we've come, you can look back into the, uh, into the I call it the New Harbor and or the Great Salt Pond. Uh, wasn't really called the Great Salt Pond till relatively recently in the island's history. It was almost since the time that the uh, entry was put in place in 1895, it was really the new harbor to, uh, to make the delineation from the old harbor, which was uh, around 1883 when that breakwater went in. So uh, this is new relative to the old harbor. And I always think that Black Islanders were very creative with their naming and very factual the new harbor and the old harbor. What else do you need? So looking back, before we head back, um, if you look in the other direction, you can see the uh, chief's house and it's always referred to the chief, uh, the Coast Guard chief. He uh, had separate quarters for his family from the uh, station men who would have been in the station house. And, uh, but it's really a beautiful site now. It's not in such great shape but it's uh, what a wonderful setting for, for housing. And it's my understanding that our new police chief uh, is going to be staying here. Um, it has been only summer quarters and it up until recently, it was reserved by the Coast Guard uh, for Coast Guard personnel, but they gave that up a uh, number of years ago and now prefer just to come over. Um, occasionally, if they want to come over, they just bring their one of their boats and tie up at the dock and their personnel stay on the boat, but they don't usually come uh, other than to, um, for, to assist in something immediately. So that's the, uh, the chief's house. And looking back, you can get, I get the sweep of this. You can see, um, oh yes, the, the station house, the boat house, the chief's house, the garage that goes with the chief house. And you can just make out the roof here of the, uh, of the motor pool building. But in the foreground, some wonderful uh, plants. Uh, what was very obvious this day was the Dusty Miller uh, and it has a, a stalk of flowers still. Most of the flowers are passed for the summer, but there were still, it, it was not, overly blooming, but it was still fresh. There were still a little bit, a few yellow flowers in there. And it's just, again, the texture of Dusty Miller is just an amazing plant. And we've gone back to the boathouse here, and there's a pathway that you can take uh, up towards the uh, Coast Guard Road or Champlain Road. It dead ends at the, uh, at the boathouse. Um, and so you can take this path up to, um, to get onto the road to make your way back to however you want to go. Uh, in this case, if you go up this path and turn around, you'll come to the Committee for the Great Salt Ponds information kiosk, and you can look back down on the beach there. But I continued on, oops, before I did, I noticed that the uh, Rosa Ragosa is still blooming, although again, not in the great mats of it of, of late June. And uh, there was a little patch here that just had a lot of white Rosa Ragosa and it was pure white. I, it was, you do see that, but this one seemed particularly white to me. And of course, lots of rose hips are ripening now. Along this path also was a little bit of a, a landside plant. This is Sundrop. Uh, I think that's such a perfect name for this, little drops of sun. It's in the primrose family. Uh, and 
they weren't doing really well here, but they were doing well enough to bloom and have seed pods and um, be promoting the next generation and op offer a little happiness in their yellowness. And then I got back up onto uh, what I grew up knowing as Coast Guard Road, but uh, is also known as Champlain Road. As you walk back, so you can see the docks that we had come by, uh, but this just shows you how vulnerable this area is. This is low tide. At high tide, the water is here. At really high tide, the water is here. At super high tide and big winds, the water is here. This is a very vulnerable area. And thus, uh, there's an effort by homeowners in the area to try to maintain the dune system along here as, as a break, as a sandbagging, if you will, um, uh, to protect this road. But uh, this will be among the first to go, I'm sure. Um, and this, there's a few of these signs along the way that this is uh, uh, help preserve our dunes and they're trying to reduce the number of vehicles parking along here. These are put in place by uh, homeowners in the area. I will say that Coast Guard Road and Champlain Road is a town road and all people are allowed to be on this road. Uh, it is not owned by the homeowners in the area. So, there we will be going next week across the channel to Hippocampus, the old breach, Skipper's Island, and on to Andy's Way for our final segment. And I'm sure it'll be delightful. Our checklist is growing. Actually, I forgot to add some birds, which I'll have to fill in before next week. And probably by next week, we'll have to get rid of the picture and just have lists of things, animals and plants and insects that we have seen. Uh, along the way. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen and happy to take any questions or comments. Thanks, Kim. Um, I had one question. Just right. um, when you're going around the Cormac Cove, you, know, you had different substrates, you had like the sandy and then you had more rocky. Was it just basically the wind where, you know, erosion and wind and where things were piling up? Because it's, yeah, it it's basically, it's basically the flow of water and when it water. carries, it carries the sand in and where there's more activity, it takes the sand, it's more likely to take the sand out and expose the stones. And so basically when you notice that, that it's, the center part, the most inner part, that is the sandiest and the mm -hmm. muddiest. And it, it's, it's a very long, shallow, um, in the aerial view, you can see how the, uh, I guess it would be the uh, western corner is all built up because that's where the sand builds up and it okay. tends to not build up on the other side. And then that northern corner um, is more exposed because it's closer to the harbor as a whole and near the channel entrance. So there tends to be more energy there to take sand away. Okay, makes sense. Yep, it's all about the physics. All right, well, that's great. And so we got one more, one the, homes, more. the home stretch around the pond. Yeah. <laughs> Kim, no. I have a question. Yeah. This is Josie. Hi, Josie. Um, They've, ta they've taken out the ramp from the major Coast Guard station, the boat ramp, or is that still going down to the water? It's still there, it's still going down the water, but they have it fenced off because the beams are so badly rotted that you can't really use it for most of it. Um, and, you know, I don't know what the ultimate does, uh, but that property uh, needs a lot of work. Um, the house, the station house, the, the boathouse itself. I mean, it's all being used now, but um, it needs work. And the, the town, you know, everything is triage, so it tends to be, you know, uh, low on the list. But the town's really going to need to decide what to do and how. What's the best way to maintain that property? Some of us would love to see it developed in a public-private partnership where you could maybe get some research opportunities in there and develop it more of a campus, maybe have some fish raising um, uh, tanks and things. It's right close to the water, be easy to get a flow of fish and a flow of water and start raising, you know, market fish or um, research center. 
um, it's probably underutilized as uh, summer housing, mostly summer housing for town employees. But that is going to be a big nut to crack. But mm -hmm. the first thing that you'll want to be able to do is um, launch boats from there. And uh, right now they don't launch boats from there. They have a dock, very good dock system. But if they're launching the, the, the harbors boats all get stored there in the winter. But when they go to launch them, they take them over to the boat launching ramp um, over by um, Dead Eyes that we saw a couple of segments ago. Right. I just had pictures of the launching of the lifesavers going out you now on their right. dollies and their oars and out to sea to rescue ships in distress. So yeah, new version. Mm. Yeah. yeah, need a new version. Rescue the pond, and the interestingly, planet. Interestingly, the Coast Guard station itself and was a new version uh, for that because once radios and uh, electronics became more prevalent in the you know 18 no sorry 19 early 1900s 1920s 1930s, they no longer needed early 1900s they needed they no longer needed to rely on um, uh, the 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 life saving. Um, core to patrol the island's perimeter looking for uh, distress uh, boats mm -hmm. and shipwrecks. Now the radios, you, you knew before people washed up on the shore that they were going to wash up. <laughs> Didn't have to wait for somebody to observe it. And so with it in increased electronics and communication um, and motors, they're no longer sailing and rowing. They had inboard motors. Now you can have a life-saving station like the Coast Guard that uh, was not immediately visible to the coastline, but could leave with a motorized boat and go to the scene much more quickly than, um, you know, the, the eight men in the, in the, in the pulling uh, boat and the preacher's buoy trying to save people. So times evolved uh, in a funny way. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Beautiful. Great. Okay. Okay, everybody, Bye. stay cool out there. Definitely. Okay, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Kim. Yep. Bye-bye. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah, you're, it's great. You're welcome. Bye. Bye.